So welcome to the Rome Center for Political Philosophy. Our interview today will take place in English, but for our Italian viewers, I will make a, a brief introduction in Italian. Mi presento, sono Anna Saronia, neolaureata in filosofia presso l'Università degli Studi di Roma 3. Sono qui oggi con David Levy, docente presso la John Cabot University, e il nostro primo ospite, Wayne Ambler, ex professore universitario, al suo nuovo progetto, Get Ready for Rome. Saluto entrambi. Sono contenta di introdurre questo primo appuntamento e sono anche molto emozionata. Si tratta di un progetto di collaborazione con David che inizia oggi ufficialmente e parte proprio da Roma. La nostra proposta è infatti quella di ripensare la filosofia politica, ma in termini più ampi, proprio come una filosofia di vita. Come ben inteso da, dagli antichi prima di noi, la filosofia politica indaga i diversi modi possibili di vivere insieme e si rega inevitabilmente a una riflessione più ampia sulle caratteristiche e le potenzialità della natura umana. Per questo oggi ringrazio Wayne Ambler che ci offre le sue conoscenze sulla Roma antica da una prospettiva alquanto inedita. Invito dunque David a proseguire presentando l'ospite di oggi. Thanks Anna. Uh, Professor Wayne Ambler is uh, the author of uh, several much cited essays on Aristotle's politics. Uh, he has translated two very important books by Xenophon and two wonderful books by Xenophon, The Education of Cyrus and The Anabasis. He has co-translated several comedies of Aristophanes, among a number of other works. He was for 10 years the director of the Rome program of the University of Dallas. And he is now Professor Emeritus at the University, at the University of, of Colorado Boulder. His current project, uh, he has been studying the, the, the city of Rome and the meaning of the city of Rome. And his current project is a podcast series on Rome, which is available at the website getreadyforrome.com. Wayne, welcome to the Rome Center for Political Philosophy. Well, thanks so much. It's great to be with you. I look forward to the conversation. We're very pleased to have you. Let me start out with a very general, very big question. Um, maybe you can help us start, maybe you can help us uh, start to think about this question. What is, uh, what is political philosophy and why should we care about it? Uh, yeah, well, those are two wonderful and uh, two very big questions. Uh, I think Anna has already made a good start on the question of what political philosophy is, and I'm in complete agreement with what she had to say. I would, uh, for a simple start, put it like this, that it's the attempt to move from opinions about political things to knowledge about political things. Um, and so the implication is that we all have political opinion, political and moral opinions. But from the point of view of political philosophy, there's reason to doubt that these opinions convey the truth and the whole truth. They need to be investigated. So for example, the American Declaration of Independence begins by saying, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, and so forth. But the implication of the declaration is that this is a position that is held because it is self-evident. It doesn't need to be proven, it doesn't need to be tested. And this to me makes a lot of sense. If you're trying to start a country, you can't begin with a philosophical argument that goes on for months or years. You need something simple. But from the point of view of political philosophy, the question has to come up. Are these truths self-evident? Do we have rights that, are, that we're endowed with? If we do, 
what rights are there? It says, among which are life, liberty, and, and pursuit of happiness. How many other are there? An infinite number. And then things get even more interesting, I would say, but also more complicated when you consider that there are other very worthy sources that would say, no, human beings do not have inalienable rights. And this is not the best way to start thinking about human beings living together in society. So I'm thinking, for example, of an argument I remember years ago from Karl Marx, which maintains that when you start thinking about human beings as endowed with individual rights, it's kind of an encouragement to human selfishness uh, and to viewing human beings as though they are isolated one from another. It's my right to my life, to my pursuit of happiness. I don't owe you anything. So Marx used the, the phrase, uh, it views human beings as, as isolated monads. That is a one, a, another one, another one. It implies we're asocial. That could be true. Maybe we are asocial in this way, but what I'm trying to suggest is that it's really a more complicated question than it seems at first. And that's what I think political philosophy tries to do is to recognize the difficulty of this question. Um, let me go on just a little bit longer and, and say that I don't know how it is in Italian, but in the United States, we often use the word philosophy as a kind of uh, pretentious way of saying my opinion. So we say um, a soccer coach, a, a coach of calcio might say, my philosophy uh, is to emphasize the defense and use short passes and things like this. This is not what I'm suggesting. This is a degradation of the term so that it just becomes a pretentious word for opinion. What I'm suggesting is that what political philosophy properly understood wants to be is a replacement of opinion by knowledge. And so it raises huge challenges and further questions, not for me today, but in the future for, for you all. Well, if it's to replace opinion by knowledge, what is knowledge? How do we recognize? What are its standards? And if we say it's place knowledge by political, uh, in political matters, well, what are political matters? What are the boundaries? Does that include moral matters? Does it include theological matters? So I don't present my answer as complete, but it's, I think, a good beginning to replace opinions by knowledge in matters of politics. The second part of uh, David's question was, and why should we care? And I, I think that's a wonderful part of the question because I'd say for the most part, we don't care. Uh, that is, uh, the, the streets are not crowded with people practicing political philosophy. So for the most part, we don't care. And I think that um, the reasons we should care is because knowledge is more precious than opinion. Um, knowledge is stable, that doesn't move around. If it truly is knowledge, it doesn't change. Opinions change, um, and it, we can act on opinions that are wrong, so we're acting blindly, whereas knowledge is solid and durable. But then why don't people care? Uh, let me briefly give two reasons for this, because I say political philosophy, we should care. I also say political philosophy, we don't care, <laughs> so why? And I think the reasons are that for the most part, on moral questions, on political questions, we oftentimes think that we already know everything we need to know. So we don't seek knowledge because we think we already have the knowledge that we need. We think the way the Declaration of Independence speaks that our opinions are self-evident. So they don't need to be in investigated. And, um, this is just, by the way, one of the reasons I love, I love Plato as an author, because he makes it very plain that we do not start in ignorance, searching for the truth. You know, the way Aristotle's metaphysics in the first line might imply, all men by nature desire to know. 
I'm sure there's a way in which that's true, but the truth that I'm trying to suggest is no. All people by nature think they already do know. <laughs> Uh, they have solid opinions. And that makes the search for knowledge more complicated because they, you first have to be persuaded that you don't have what you need to try to get. And that's, that's what's wonderful about Plato. He's, uh, Socrates is just so skillful in getting people to see that they don't know what they think they do. The second problem is diametrically opposed and you would say contradictory to the first. So problem one, we think we know what we don't. And problem two, we think we can't know. So why search for something if knowledge is impossible? Um, if, you, if you really think, you know, if you have a conversation with somebody and you say, I'm searching for the absolute truth on moral questions, <laughs> uh, there's a good chance that that person will say, you know, give it up. It's it's not possible. It isn't. We cannot know these things. So, there's two very different opinions that make political philosophy difficult to pursue in practice. One, we already know. Two, we can't know. Both of them say, "Don't bother." <laughs> um, I say, "Bother." È una cosa importante per me. So, uh, those are my suggestions anyway. Sì, penso sia molto importante. Hai già menzionato dei temi molto uh, densi, sicuramente quello della conoscenza. May I ask you uh, one question? What are um, your uh, Alex, what are uh, what works? Anna, excuse me. Manta, before you start, before you ask your question, before you move on to the next question. I had a quick follow-up for Wayne. Can I, if I can go on? Sure. Um, and then we'll get uh, something came to mind, Wayne, as you were talking about the Declaration of Independence, and you you pointed out that from the point of view, the Declaration speaks of self-evident truths, but from the point of view of political philosophy, or from the point of view of a political philosopher those self-evident truths might, might be opinions that need further investigation. We need to ask, is, is, are these in fact truths? And if so, why? And what are the alternatives? So my question, if that's, I, I, think, I think that's what you were saying. Absolutely. My, my question is, by raising these kinds of questions, about the fundamental opinions of, of whether it's the fundamental opinions of American society or the fundamental opinions of Italian society or the fundamental opinions of uh, Iranian society of any, presumably all, all societies are based on certain fundamental opinions. If political philosophy is going to be raising difficult questions about those opinions and really asking, in effect, are they really true? Doesn't that risk undermining, weakening the society's faith in itself? And uh, does, does it risk undermining society itself? Yes, I think it does. I think that political philosophy is essentially a radical act activity. Um, and I, I find it somewhat amusing that in the United States, quote, traditional education is oftentimes, liberal arts education is often presented as though it's stodgy and conservative and all in agreement with itself. And I think that almost nothing is further from the truth. Um, political philosophy is radical. Um, political, the political philosophers don't agree among themselves. They push issues as far as they can go. So I think that there is, as you indicated, an essential and fundamental tension or tug of war or pull between um, established societies and probing investigation of the opinions that are at their foundation. So I think that's true. You know, I think that this means that political 
philosophy might not have other benefits to offer these, these societies, I think it, it just might, because if a society is rest on some, rests on an opinion that is false in some important way, it could be useful for that society to know how it's false. It might not be able to solve the problem uh, simply. I don't think there are simple solutions to most political problems, frankly, but I, I think it might be able to uh, mitigate certain problems if it studies them carefully. So I don't think, even though political philosophy, I think, is radical, I don't think that the automatic response to that is to ignore it altogether, thinking that there aren't real problems that it could help with. Um, there are other ways in which I think one might uh, defend it, but uh, I, I think I would leave it at that by now, plus this minor point. Uh, this is a major theme for ancient authors who did not believe in such a knee-jerk way or such an automatic way as we do in free speech and free expression. They recognized that sometimes societies needed to defend their core opinions um, with special measures, let's say. So Socrates got himself in trouble with Athens and he was executed by the Athenian citizens. And one of the things that I think is wonderful about ancient authors, <laughs> this may sound terrible, but they don't, Plato, I think, tremendously admired Socrates. Maybe he loved them, and Xenophon too. But they don't present his execution at the hands of the Athenians as though the Athenians didn't have some reason for doing what they did. That is, their, their hearts are large enough to admit that the Socrates that they admired tremendously did come with some problems for Athens as his associations with Alcibiades showed and as the very nature of his activity showed. So this is not a defense of Athens for doing what Athens did, but it's, it's an admission that the issue is complicated. And, and they, the ancient authors, Xenophon and Plato, refused to treat it um, as just an occasion for beating up on the Athenians or ending. Yeah. Sure. May I ask you now of uh, political philosophy are to your heart? Yeah. Uh, you may. And I've already, I've already tipped my hand. I've already indicated Aristotle, Plato, and Xenophon um, for these authors and their political works. Um, I guess the, you know, the next question is why. And so I could, I mean, I, I think that one thing that the ancients are especially good at, so I'll speak collectively, is at showing problems and challenges and admitting that they really are problems and challenges and they don't offer easy answers. There's, they don't offer the usual opinions that are circulating in our uh, day. They're a breath of fresh air. There's no political correctness to them. So I was just reading yesterday another attack on Aristotle on the grounds that he's not a lover of democracy that's terrible, should we cancel him from the curriculums in American universities because he doesn't love democracy? I say, I love Aristotle because he's, because he's not a lover of democracy. Um, not, that, not that I am an enemy of democracy, I'm not, but I'm, I think it's important to admit that giving every individual a vote does not solve all political problems. There are, other things that need to be addressed, other problems that need to be considered, you can, you can have a majority vote and things still go terribly. Uh, the majority can be ignorant, the majority can be vicious. I happen to read, be reading Tacitus in these days and to see the, the character of the Roman people in the first century AD, it's, it's terrible. So it's, I'm not an enemy of democracy and Aristotle I don't think is an enemy of a democracy, but he's not willing to give a simplistic account of it as though it always solves all problems. I love that. Plato, I think, is just terrific because 
of what I already said. He he's so skilled at helping us to see what we don't know and and challenging our confidence. I remember when I was many years ago when I was an undergraduate and sitting in a library reading, I think for the first time a platonic dialogue, and it was a dialogue called the Carmides, in which the question came up about how wonderful it would be if we had the knowledge of the future. Wow, wouldn't that be neat to know what's going to happen? And Socrates argues that it doesn't do any good to know the future unless you also know the good. If you can't tell better from worse, if you don't know, not just believe, but if you don't really know what is good, knowledge of the future isn't going to enable you to act correctly. So Plato, by arguments like these, can really make us feel strongly the importance of knowing what we don't know, and especially knowing um, the good. So those are, those are at least some of the reasons that I, that I like the ancients. There are other, oh, here's another a, a thought on Aristotle that I stumbled on this when I was reading, doing my doctoral dissertation 40 years ago. Um, I found many secondary authors, many scholars who would treat, would imply that they knew what Aristotle thought about a subject. They would imply, I know what he thinks about democracy. I know what he thinks about slavery. I know what he thinks about government in general. I know what he thinks about the virtue of moderation. I, um, and I, I always thought, you know, when I was studying Aristotle, I just noticed his use of the word if all the time, that he is arguing so often with an if clause. If this is the case, then this. But what about that if? And so I came across a passage in Montaigne in which the Montaigne maintain, you know, said of Aristotle that he's known as, quote, the prince of the dogmatists. That is, he has dogmas, simple, clear answers to everything. And then Montaigne went on to say, that is so far from the truth, <laughs> that he, his opinions are so complicated and so um, intermixed with if clauses that it's often difficult to tell where he stands. So the ancient authors come with a high burden of interpretation. They're not, their opinions are not obvious, but they're rich. Yeah, and um, probably it's also the fact that we can think about uh, political philosophy as a resource, as uh, something that can make has think about things we give for granted, but they're not, as you said, even uh, uh, in democracy. So. Wayne, um, let's talk about your current project. You are currently in your getreadyforrome.com project. You are studying not exactly a political philosopher or a book, per se, but rather the city of Rome. Can you tell us more about that? Why are you studying a city? Why are you studying, why are you studying Rome and not Plato or Aristotle? <laughs> That's an excellent question. Uh, I'm not always sure that I've made the right decision, but for the most part, I think I have, and I'm, I'm happy with it. I mean, I start by saying I just love the city. I, I came to Rome uh, a long time ago, uh, 1988, and did not know a thing about the city really, and wasn't even sure that it was going to be great for me to be there. Um, but I immediately fell in love with it. And not always for the best reason, sometimes just because it's just so charming and pleasant to be there. But eventually I came to see that so many important issues in political are reflected in the buildings and the monuments that I thought it was a stunningly good place to learn. And I was there as a teacher and I felt it was a tremendous resource for teaching young students who may not themselves have fallen in love with Plato yet or with Machiavelli or um, modern liberalism, but they loved being in the city. And so if I could um, I guess I would say that I, I see my study of Rome not as a study of a city as opposed to a book, but as a study of a city with the help of books and with the hope of leading 
other people to books. So it's, uh, it's not a displacement of, of reading and thinking about books, but it's a substitute. And I think, it, I think it's very good for me, actually, but I'm also thinking of myself as a teacher and not just as a, as a student um, or as myself as a scholar. Um, I found through experience that leading students through the streets of Rome, pointing out monuments, really enliv enlivened them to very fundamental um, political issues. I can put these in, in these sorts of things that I think the city can help with into two categories, if that might help. One category is Rome is, is just a wonderful, I mean, you can't learn this just from walking the streets, you have to read a little bit too, but Rome is a wonderful reservoir of political experience. So all, if you wanna know how politics happens, how it unfolds, what its characteristics are, Rome is this wonderful reservoir with all kinds of case studies of, of tremendous interest. Um, I, I always like the phrase of Alexander Hamilton, one of the founding fathers in the United States. He said, experience is the best, or history, is the best oracle of wisdom. And in, in Rome, you have 2,500 years, depending on how you count them, of rich experience. So if you want to see the example of people that think they're doing something that will serve their interests and they end up only making things worse, and you wonder how that can happen, well, Rome can give you six or eight <laughs> Wonderful examples of that, starting from what the Roman people did in response to Mark Antony's funeral oration, for example. Or I am lately been reading about the mausoleum of Augustus, planning a podcast on that. I thought it was striking to, to learn that five of the first six sets of cremated remains that were lodged in the mausoleum were of people that Augustus had hoped would succeed him in political power. So he has, you know, he has Marcellus, he has Agrippa, he has Gaius, he has Lucius, he has Drusus. He, he's hoping that each one of these will outlive him and will succeed him. They all die and are put into the mausoleum well in advance of Augustus. It's a wonderful illustration of the problem of succession in a monarchy. And depending on how you read it, it can also explain why the succession or different reasons why the problem of succession in a monarchy is difficult. For example, if Augustus indicates, promotes too rapidly and too clearly someone to be a successor, that identifies that person to everybody else. <laughs> so anyone who might like that job knows then that this person, he is his enemy and he can resent him and show envy uh, or maybe go further and try to eliminate him in some way. So I think that, you know, that's just one way the monument of, of the mausoleum of Augustus can do it. Uh, you wanna study how to tell a good lie in politics and get away with it. Um, Rome has wonderful examples. The, um, you know, the story of Sinon in book two of Virgil's, or Sinon in book two of Virgil's Aeneid. It's a brilliant lie. How does a Greek persuade Trojans to bring a, Tro a Greek horse inside their city? <laughs> Not an easy job, very risky. He pulls it off. Um, so there's just you know, great stories, I think. Um, the problem of ambition is well illustrated in Roman history, starting with well, probably before, but illustrated very clearly by Romulus and Remus, two brothers who had got along very well until it became clear that one of them had the possibility of being the founder of Rome. <laughs> and their friendly fraternal relationship broke down rapidly. <laughs> so, that, so that's answer one, the reservoir of political questions. But then a bigger and more difficult kind of answer, I think, is that I it, at least in the United States, I don't know exactly how it is in Italy now, but there's a big debate going on in academic communities about Western civilization in general. 
Uh, should we be embarrassed about it because it's the place where we find slavery, empire, subjugation of women? Um, should we just, you know, try to bash it? Um, or alternatively, do we say, oh, Western civilization, this is our tradition, it's wonderful, we need to return to it. And this is a big debate. And Rome is a wonderful, I mean, I don't think you can answer that question very well either way, unless you spend some time thinking about what Western civilization is or was. <laughs> That's the first question. And Rome has so much to say about that. Um, you could say that it was the capital of Western civilization for 80% of the time that Western civilization, make, it makes sense to speak of it. First, the capital of the great pagan Roman empire, later the capital of the Roman Catholic papacy, which helped to, to make Europe identifiable as Europe by Christianizing it. So that's a, that's a less, it's a more vague set of questions, but I think it's wonderful and important. Um, I think in my own view, what Rome can help us do is to see the complexity of Western civilization. It's not simple and easy to pigeonhole as one thing. It's in some respects divided against itself. Um, to use the word that you have to use today, it's, it, it's tremendously diverse. It's, it's more than diverse, it's internally antagonistic. Christians and pagans didn't get along well. Modern secular Democrats don't think much of the Pope, et cetera. So, that's why I'm studying Rome. Now, Wayne, in, in, in the course of studying Rome, you've, I'm sure, been, been reading various modern historians, uh, uh, political historians, social historians, art historians. There's a lot of literature, uh, to say the least, about Rome. How is your project different from what sets it apart from these, uh, this, the major trends in this literature, in the scholarly literature? Yeah, good. It's a it's a, an important and and big question. And of course, I can't characterize all contemporary literature all that easily. But I would say, what I'm trying to do is different in two main ways. Um, it's different in where I begin and it's different than where I end. And I am uh, starting from the physical monuments of the city and the art that still remains in Rome, which is maybe you know, not the best place to begin if you're wanting to just give the history pure and simple. And it's certainly not the place most historians begin. It's where a guidebook might begin, but not an historian for the most part. But that's where I'm starting. And that's partly for pedagogical reasons that I think the city is so exciting and so interesting to students. Um, and then my aspiration is to move from tangible, visible reflections of a particular answer to questions of political philosophy, trying to move to the debate which those answers imply. Um, and that too, I think, is different from most historical approaches to the city, because I don't think most historical approaches are concerned to identify and follow that debate among, I, I use this language, it's a bit strange, but to use the, the debate among the different rooms or the different embodiments of the city of Rome. And I think that there are such. Let me try an example. Um, I think one of the wonderful monuments of in, in Rome from the point of view of what I'm trying to achieve is the statue of Giordano Bruno in Campo dei Fiori. And um, it's, it's a tremendously radical statue and it becomes even more radical if you know something about Bruno and what happened to him. And then if you go back and find the speech that was given at the inauguration of the statue by a philosophy professor named Giovanni Bovio, it becomes more interesting and more radical as, as well. It is an anti-Catholic and anti-Christian statue. The Pope had just lost his political power in 1870. The statue went up 13, I think it is, years later. Um, and Bruno is glaring in the direction of the Vatican. 
and when Bovio gave the address that inaugurated the statue, Bovio said, this statue causes more fear in the heart of the Pope, which he took to be a good thing, <laughs> more fear in the heart of the Pope than did the seizure of his political power 13 years ago. Why? Because this statue stands for a fundamentally different way of thinking. Before, religion with a capital R gave us all, the, all of the answers. Now, this is my formulation, not Bovio's exactly, but now reason with a capital R is going to be the source of our answers. So he sees it as a secular monument, anti-papal, anti-Christian indirectly at least, pro-reason, pro-enlightenment. And that statue facing the Vatican where St. Peter's has got, I don't know what, 200 statues of popes and uh, other ways of suggesting the, the themes of Christianity. The statue of Bruno says no to all of that. And that calls upon us to ask the question, was Bovio and Bruno, were they right? Did, were they right on everything? Did they lose anything as they went forward with the, with the new Rome that they wanted to create? So I think, um, you know, I think that that's a tremendous and important thing, issue that can be brought out well from the physical evidence of Rome and that will actually capture the imagination of students. I think the same is true. Uh, uh, maybe that's enough on that question. I don't know if you. No, I just wanted to say that as a, a philosophy, um, philosophy student, yeah, uh, who had about uh, uh, Roman history, um, it's a very useful approach actually because it helps you to understand better and to remember better even. Uh, uh, historical aspects uh, or dates or debates uh, through experiencing our own town, which is Rome, which is uh, very rich and uh, I think it's very useful. So I wanted to ask you what questions of political philosophy does the study of Rome suggest and help us to think about? Yeah, very, uh, another wonderful question and um, a big one. I would, um, I, would, I would start, I guess, by stressing at, at, at least um, three. Um, one question is, what, are the, what is the possible relationship between, what is the, you know, the best relationship? What are the possible relationships between politics on the one hand and religion on the other? So by my way of looking at Rome, we get multiple answers to this question. We, we have the ancient pagan gods who were a tremendously important part of the political life of the ancient Romans. Um, taking of auspices, offering of temples to gods if battles were to be, were, were to be won, using gods as ways of strengthening the law and so forth. Then a very different answer we get when Rome becomes Christian in the fourth century. And so for 1500 years or more, you have another social, social way of handling religion in society in which the Pope is a, a major religious authority or major moral authority. Everyone is Roman Catholic. It's not an option. You reject it, you become a heretic, your life is at risk. So there is no freedom of religion, but it's a different religion from the paganism. It's much more transcendent and, and transpolitical. I think this is a wonderful reason for looking at the apse mosaics in Rome is to see the way the, the faith is presented in the early stages of Christianity, that it's very prominent, but it's not at all political. It's a holy city's of the next life, the Holy Jerusalem. And then Rome gives you also um, modern secular democracy, at least in my view, when since, since the overthrow of the popes in 1870, um, religion is much more free, it's, it's not a requirement. And so the relation of religion and politics is something where you get three different societies in the course of Rome's long history. I'm simplifying, but at least three big ones, and they have different answers. 
Uh, a second um, issue is the form of government. Um, what about democracy? What about the role of the people? Is it good? Is it bad? What are the problems? You get very different answers there. With the ancient Romans having had a republic, not a democracy, but a republic that lasted almost 500 years. What, what granted that republic its stability? Where did that come from? You have then a papal regime of 1500 years, which was anti-Republican, monarchical, or even theocratic. And today we have a modern liberal democracy installed in, in Italy, uh, its capital is Rome. So uh, three different approaches to political form, I would say. And then thirdly, the third and last big issue for starters, I think that responds to your question. I think the question of what is human excellence or what is human virtue? What, what goals should we strive for as moral creatures? The answers are very different in pagan Rome as opposed to Christian Rome. And I think perhaps today, I mean, um, Machiavelli is an author who's very good on the subject, of course, as he launches major attacks on the Christian virtues as being um, incompatible with good political life, as he sees it. There's too much attention to the eternal fatherland. There's nothing in the Christian virtues that calls your attention to this need to support your political regime. Sure, render under Caesar what is Caesar's, but that's sort of dismissive. I mean, it's something, a minor obligation, pay your taxes. That's not to involve your heart and to draw forth your sacrifices from the New Testament understanding. So I think, you know, what the, what the virtues are is another big question that Rome can help to raise. To put it all in a very general way, I'd say, we now live in an era of modern liberalism Rome too, Rome, New York, Paris, London, we're all modern modern liberals. There are differences, but on that big point, we're all the same. But Rome for most of its history was of course not modern and it wasn't liberal either. It was a pagan aristocracy. It was a papal theocracy. And maybe these alternative solutions to the social problem can help us gain perspective on modern liberalism, help us see what we do well, perhaps also well. Uh, when you think of the time and it's been 150 years since Italy was united under a more or less modern liberal monarchy at stage of the game. Ancient Rome lasted, depending on how you count it, 1500 years, the papacy 1500 years. So we're relatively newcomers compared to what Rome had done in the past. And it would behoove us, I think, to try to think long-term. Rome can help us try to think long-term. Yeah, and you mentioned uh, uh, the Republican period, and there's a, a crucial event, I think. Uh, in the early Roman Republic, uh, the vigorous protests of uh, the pubs against the oppressive behavior of the patricians led to the creation of the crucial office of, a, of the tribune of the plebs. So what political lessons can we learn from this episode? In particular, I have in mind the following problem. We as uh, Italians uh, tend to think that we cannot change society and politics very much. Should the example of uh, the Roman plebs lead us uh, to take uh, a more hopeful participation and uh, the possibility of improving our condition? Should it teach us uh, to rediscover our, our political vocation, maybe? Yeah. Um, excellent, excellent questions and uh, questions that bear on the general issue of when and how history can offer us direct guidance to the problems that we face in our own lives. And I am a strong believer that history can do this, but with uh, necessary cautions, that is that sometimes a, situ a situation that looks the same uh, may, may, may be in fact different in important respects. So that would be an important part of what I would say. I would say in the first thing, you know, I think the first question for getting contemporary Italian politics 
um, which I'm sure you know more about than I do, but forgetting that, them for a moment. Um, your first part of your question is what we can learn from the experience of the tribunes in the early period of the Roman Republic. And I, I would say we, can, we, we learn, need to learn there that human beings, when, when possessed of political power, may very well be tempted to use that political power to advance their own interests at the expense of the interests of others. And so the others need to be very attentive uh, to that threat and need to be vigilant um, in seeing that they minimize it or oppose it completely. So I agree with what I think was the gist of your question, that the tribunes were right uh, to stand up to the um, that, the, the, that the plebeians were right to stand up to the patricians and seek an office that would help protect them as the tribunate came to be. I'm all for that. Um, then what's the bearing of that on contemporary Italian politics? And I would say that if the, if the problems of contemporary Italian problem, the politics are similar to the problems that the tribunes faced, then the example of the tribunes should be followed. But I wonder whether they are the same. Um, and then if they're not, then it becomes more complicated to figure out what the best solution to the problem might be. Uh, I, again, I know you know more, a lot more about Italian politics than I do. But in fact, in my own experience when I was in Italy for a while, was rather in accord with what you say. That is that I met a number of Italians who were completely uninvolved in the political life of their country. and. The reason that they gave us, they figured out they can't do anything about it. And that, that doesn't seem to me to be the most helpful political attitude. Um, so I do think that there's a challenge there. But when I think of the plebs in, say, the fifth century BC, um, and then I think of the situation of Italy or the United States today, it seems that there are these differences that the plebs were separate from the patricians as a fixed and determinate class. And there was no movement between the classes or, or very, very little. So there was a rigid and formal exclusion from the political process um, of the plebs by the patricians. Today, everybody has the vote. And it's not, I don't know that a new office exactly like the tribune is necessary for a thoughtful and energized majority to exercise political power. It seems that what is more necessary is to figure out what needs to be done with that power, which is already legally available <laughs> in the form of the vote, as, as it seems to me again. Um, and that I would again say going back to Livy, there's, I, don't, I, I don't see an easy answer to the question, but I do think that going back to Livy, there are some suggestions. I mean, um, I think one of the things in Livy that's so impressive is the value of thoughtful, clever, dedicated leadership. And um, for example, in the creation of the Roman Republic, it never would have happened without somebody like Lucius Junius Brutus, who saw the occasion, saw how to mobilize the Italian, the, I'm sorry, the Roman people at that stage of the game against the Tarquin monarchy, um, how to guide their action, what to do in the early moments of forming a new and alternative regime. Um, so I'm, I, I think that's just tremendously important. And I think Livy stresses that in, in many places as well. But I guess the main answer would be the, the first thing to focus on is to diagnose the problem of contemporary politics in Italy and the United States, and then to see whether there's a strict analog to that in the ancient past. Wayne, uh... Rome has been an object of admiration for centuries, um, in, in, including in, in modern times, at least until quite recently. For example, many of the uh, American founders admired 
Rome. You mentioned earlier, you mentioned Alexander Hamilton. I think he was one of the great admirers of Rome among the Americans. Uh, in the Italian Risorgimento, I suspect that admiration for Rome, for the Roman Republic may have played a part. Why, why has Rome been so admired? Why has ancient Rome, ancient uh, pagan Rome, been so admired by so many uh, citizens and statesmen in modern times? That's that's part one of my question, and then I have a I have a I have a follow up to that. There's more. <laughs> There's more. <laughs> Go. What's, oh, oh, okay. I'll I'll, um, I'll I'll let you answer the first part, and then I'll have and I have my follow up. I'll try to answer the first part. Um, this happens to be a, a topic that I assigned to myself in one of my podcasts. So I'm going to try to recall what I said in the podcast that I entitled "Introduction to Ancient Rome," and obviously different admirers of uh, of ancient Rome disagree about what it is in particular that should be admired. And I don't know whether anyone admires the whole thing that we pick and choose. And even the American founders, I think it's interesting, you know, and, and I think, I mean, I love this about them. They didn't just say, all right, Rome was great. Let's imitate them. They said, Rome is interesting. Let's see what we can learn from them. And so the founders definitely borrowed from the Roman experience, but there were parts of the Roman experience that they said, no, 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 that's not for us. So for example, the Romans divided the executive power into two people. So there are two consuls, they could check one another. So the Americans asked, well, should we have two presidents? Should we have a plural executive, as they put it, multiple executive? I said, no. So that's great. I, I mean, I think it's, but I, I, I'm not, here to argue that everything any ancient Roman did should be automatically admired or imitated. I, I think it should be studied. So what, uh, to go back to your question, then what various things have been admired about ancient Rome? I, I, here's my list. Um, each of these points, obviously, we could pause on, but I'll just uh, try to rattle off the list. I mean, one thing is um, it lasted a long time. And no one wants to build a political system that falls apart immediately. So longevity is pretty much an, ad an admitted political goal. Obviously, it wasn't uh, 1,200 years of uninterrupted bliss. There are all sorts of revolutions and problems. But still, um, from April 21st of 753 BC you know, until 476 for the Western Empire, um, you know, that's 1,200 years. And then, the Eastern Roman Empire goes on till the fall of um, Constantinople in 1453. So longevity is, is one thing. How does a government, a political society endure? The answer may not be pretty in all cases. It may not be what we hope, but uh, it, certainly Rome deserves to be studied if, on that reason. Secondly, um, its scope. Now it's it's in bad taste in modern times to admire empire, but Rome also expanded, and that may have had something to do with what led it to endure. So it it you know it covered a swath of territory that extends beyond the the European Union, at least in terms of northern Africa, Egypt, Syria, the Holy Lands. Um, Rome was big, um, and this is a kind of odd way to put it, but I think I have to do it this way. Rome did not embrace Christian ethics, I mean, until it converted to Christianity in the fourth century. But um, this, from the point of view of Machiavelli, for example, was one of, you asked, why is it admired? Why might we imitate it? Um, because it, it didn't teach people that they should turn the other cheek. It didn't teach them that wealth is automatically bad. It, it, didn't teach them that the goal of every action is to get into heaven. Um, it didn't teach them that they had no obligations to the city. So interestingly, in a kind of negative way, I think that's um, a reason that Rome was admired. Another reason is that Rome, um, and again, this is, depends on who you're asking. This is obviously not a virtue in everybody's eyes, but Rome was not narrowly democratic. Um, had a republic for 500 years, 
but it didn't slip into uh, into strict democracy. And one of the goals of the founding fathers was, as I forget who put it this way, I don't remember whether it was Madison or Hamilton, was to find, quote, an anchor against popular fluctuations. That is to add a kind of stability to the overall tenor of, of government and to have policies that would follow after one another and would not be subject to such turbulence. And the founding fathers thought that the Republican form of government generally was better at that than a strict democracy. So the American founding fathers did not understand themselves as instituting a strict democracy. If they had wanted to do that, they wouldn't have had a Senate. They wouldn't have divided the House from the Senate. They wouldn't have given the senators six-year terms. They wouldn't have given the president a four-year term. They would have mandated direct popular election of all officials. They wouldn't have had a Supreme Court that was appointed rather than voted into power. These are signs of, uh, you know, not being anti-democratic, but having reservations about the sufficiency of democracy to do what is best for itself. And the Romans were good at that. A fifth characteristic I think that is admired is what might be called civic virtue in the Republican period, where the Romans devoted themselves to the city, to their city, to Rome first. Um, this is very different from the initial orientation of modern liberal regime. Learn your rights, get your rights, demand your rights, your rights come first. But for the old Romans, it was the duty that came first, and the duty was um, very much. Uh, Rousseau, I, you're studying Rousseau now, so maybe you would, you would see this differently or better, but I would say Rousseau was somebody who appreciated um, this quality of the uh, Roman Republic and the Spartans as well. Um, the, I think in another class of people would, um, and this is especially in the Renaissance, admire the cultural achievements of Rome. This is something different. And maybe things that are ultimately traceable to, to Athens, not, not purely of Roman origin, but their, their literature, their, you know, the fact that Lucretius and Cicero were serious philosophical thinkers, um, the beautiful art that they, with which they adorned the city, um, Ovid, Livy, this good historical writing. Tacitus. Um, so I think that's another thing. Those are the main reasons I think that Rome, ancient Rome is admired. Different parts of them would be, would be singled out by different thinkers. My, my follow-up question is you've, uh, you've alluded a couple of times uh, in our conversation to some of the complaints about Rome, some of the criticisms of Rome that we hear today, uh, which go together, are, par are part of a general critique of Western civilization, but in particular, older Western civilization. You, met, you referred to imperialism not being in fashion today. Uh, the fact that the Romans, uh, Roman women did not enjoy equal rights with men. The Romans practiced slavery and there were other, other customs and practices of the Romans that uh, we don't follow today. And that uh, we, a certain, um, there's, a, there's a certain, as you mentioned, this is a hot topic right now. I mean, what, um, what should we do? What should we say about all those aspects of Rome that um, that strike us as that, that very much contradict um, some of our some some of our most uh, uh, sacred convictions? Um, well, I guess point A would be this goes back to the question you asked some time ago, and um, of how what I'm trying to do may differ from a typical historian's approach. 
And um, I would say that one of the things I would like to do for myself is to learn from the past how to judge societies well. Um, and I think what many want to do now is just to judge ancient societies and condemn them. That is, they presume they know how to judge. I'm trying to learn how to judge. And it doesn't seem to me to be a reasonable way to proceed to start like this. I know how to judge. I know the standards of a good political society. They are A, B, C, D, E. I read them in the New York Times last week and the week before and the week before and the week before and the week before and the week before. The week before. Um, so I know them. Now I'm going to apply these to Rome. And what I find is that Rome fell way short of the standards that I've been taught to admire. I understand you know, that there definitely are, are hot issues there. And it's not really my goal to say we all should admire Rome. But my, my goal is that we should think about it in a serious and careful way. So to start with the issue of slavery, I mean, I, I've read about the rebellion of Spartacus and what the Romans did in response to it. And it's absolutely horrific. I have no interest in defending that. But how should we think about slavery in the ancient world? Here's my situation. I've never had a slave. I've never seen a slave. I've never had a friend have a slave. I've never heard slavery defended well. I have a refrigerator. I have an automobile. I have all sorts of modern labor-saving devices. I have no need of a slave. It would, a slave would just get in the way. It's the easiest thing in the world for me to attack slavery. And in fact, if I don't do that, I'm shunned at my university. And if I do do it, I'm welcomed as a, you know, someone with great foresight and sensitivity and uh, moral feelings. That's it's very superficial, I think. I mean, in the time of the Romans, every society had slaves. They didn't have refrigerators. They, it was hard for them to move from point A to point B. Um, getting food to eat was extraordinarily difficult. They didn't have a huge prison system for prisoners of war. They could kill them or they could enslave them. Um, I think just, just how to judge an issue like that is more complicated than the typical debate, not debate, the, the typical accusations that are handed out today. Um, so I, I I, again, I, you know, I, I'm reading Tacitus now, and I think he says, shows things about ancient Rome that are truly disturbing, distressing, horribly ugly. I'm not here to defend it, but it doesn't seem to be a very helpful step toward a serious education to take young people 18 years old and to make them feel that they're really moral beings because they condemn the slavery from 2000 years ago. And our own society, we don't have slaves, but we do buy our clothes that are made in factories in Bangladesh, and we don't worry too much about the conditions of the workers that are over there. So I, I see it as a, you know, a, a, there's a touch of hypocrisy in the way we treat this issue. I would like to, by looking carefully at Rome, cross-examine ourselves to try to gain some self-knowledge and see whether, in fact, in every respect, we're as superior as we think we are. And if we are, that's wonderful. But I, I do think that there are some issues we're thinking about. Um, and I, it's too easy to condemn ancient Rome for not being us. Of course, they're not us. Nobody was us. Wayne, what about the, what about the, uh, the woman issue? Uh, let's not avoid that. Um, you mentioned, you talked about slavery. Let's 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 face this problem. Were the Rome were, were the Romans, including let's say, the the great Roman authors, uh, what we would consider to be the sources of Roman wisdom for us, the ones you're reading now, like Tacitus, uh, or Cicero, or Livy, um, Lucretius, and all the rest, weren't they terribly sexist? And isn't that a, I'm, I'm playing devil's advocate here, and isn't that a, an indelible stain 
<laughs> uh, is, isn't that a reason for not reading them at all? Because it doesn't doesn't that sort of spoil the whole thing? Because they they're the more we read them, the more we'll be corrupted by them and tempted to, you know, um, tempted to be sexist ourselves. What if it rubs off on us? Well, I, I mean, I frankly, I don't think there's any chance of that. <laughs> we're, we're so sure that we understand what the proper relationship is between men and women that I don't think anybody who reads Tacitus is, is going to uh, advocate um, or try to have a wife that, that is treated in the same way as the traditional Roman wife. I also think the traditional Roman wife, I'm not sure that I understand what the traditional Roman wife or woman was because I think it varies between empire and republic. One of the striking things about Tacitus in the imperial period is how much power some women had. It seems to me like it may be the issue is a more problematic one with regard to class. I'm not sure, it's a big question, I'm not sure. But if you look at women like Livia and Agrippina in the early, uh, imperial period in Tacitus, they were they were women who had a hell of a lot more power than most men. But to, to you know to be part, try to be you know more careful about it. I would say that it it may be a more complicated question than than the slavery question, and it may make us properly more suspicious of ancient authors. But I see it so far, I guess, fairly parallel. I mean, think about the situation in, in the Roman Republic. What was that situation? The situation was Rome was small in the beginning, small, weak, and constantly at war. Who made the better warriors? Well, the Roman view, and I just doubt that it was wrong, <laughs> is that men made the better warriors. Partly, they, they tend to be larger, stronger, more aggressive. Um, and they don't, they don't bear children uh, so that they're available um, throughout their mature lives to serve in armies. And the Roman wars were violent and, and, and the way that it seems to be natural, but a way that political people rose to power politically was by their achievements on the battlefield, not only as individual soldiers, but in their capacity to lead. I don't think this is you know, simply an attractive life for all of the men, it was hard. Um, I mean, it's just staggering the losses of life on the Roman battlefield. When Rome fought Hannibal at the Battle of Cannae, they lost in a single day 60,000 soldiers. That's what male soldiers, that's what the United States lost in 10 years of the Vietnam War with a much, 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 much bigger population base. And it shook us, shook the United States to its foundations. Rome just went on. Um, and I think, so, so if you accept that as a reality for Rome, I don't know whether you do or whether you don't, but if you accept this reality, that existence is threatened, war was necessary, men were needed to be in the army, um, women were going to have children. There's, it makes sense that there'd be a, a strict division of labor. And it's not surprising, maybe you could say it's wrong, but it's not surprising that distinguished leaders on the battlefield would also then be selected uh, in terms of life. So is, is that the best way for men and women to live together in society? I'm, I'm really not sure that it is, but is it, is it a sign of a prejudice that men and women are fundamentally you know, different and unequal? Um, and that women deserve to be treated without respect. I, I think it's more a consequence of a complex social setting that Rome was in at that stage of the game, but we're not in. And you know, may our solution be better for women? <laughs> um, I think in many respects it is. Whether it will be, in, whether it is in all respects, might be nice to have another century or two under our belt before we decide with certainty. It's kind of like, I mean, no, I, 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 uh, that would be a bad thing. Anyway, that's, 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 that's how I would start with that question. I don't think, I mean, I don't think that's adequate, but I, that's my start. I would also say that uh, you, you, one of your arguments, and I think it was maybe the one that led you to say, uh, this is just because I'm being devil's advocate. So uh, I don't assume you're fully serious about this, but I do see in the modern American university, 
a tendency to cancel a thinker altogether because of an error on a particular point. This seems to me to be absolutely horrible, and it just scares me to death in terms of the future of education. <laughs> uh, because if if somebody, you know, from 150 years ago, maybe fought for the Confederacy in the United States, does that person have maybe have nothing to teach us about, say, leadership or about how to how to translate Pindar from Greek into into English? That's a real case. The, the I think the greatest 19th century Pindar scholar fought for the South in the Civil War. And there is a movement among some classicists to stop him from being read because he fought for the South. But he's also, Pindar's a very difficult Greek author. Not many people can translate him well. Not many people understand him well. That seems like a terrible thing. I, I, I mean, I hope it's not a sign of gross insens insensitivity on my part, but I'm, I'm eager to learn, e even from somebody who may have made a mistake on a, on a separate form. Yeah, I think that probably in order to solve a problem, you need to face it, actually. So uh, canceling authors uh, just for other different opinions, it's not, it's not a solution, probably. It's not. We need to face even different perspectives with all the, <laughs> the, the complexity, uh, as you said. So may I ask you one last question about uh, Rome? What about Christian Rome? What, what meaning can this Rome have for citizens of a modern secular democracy? Yeah, um, another good question. Um, I. Uh, I hope I'm not stressing too much that I'm grateful just for questions in my life. I, I like good questions. Um, at some stage of the game, I'd like answers too, but I think Rome, I think Christian Rome. So we're, you know, we're talking about 1500 years or more of and when Rome is actually the principal political figure is the Pope and everyone is Christian. Everyone, um, except the, the Jewish population is an exception. There's a small Jewish population that managed not to be prosecuted for heresy, but generally speaking, everybody else is Christian. So um, that's what we're talking about. And I would say that one thing this room, if we study it, can help us with is to remind us of questions that we're otherwise likely to forget. Because it's a room that comes at life from such a different perspective than the life of, of modern liberalism. Um, for example, I mean, does, modern liberal secular democracy answer all important human needs? Does it respond to all important human needs or not? Um, are there some longings that, um, that we have that are forgotten in our, in our modern period? And I'm thinking obviously that the way things have worked out in any event is that our modern liberal democracies tend to be very materialistic. They tend to be based very much on the desire for wealth on the part of populations. Uh, how, how thoroughgoing is this and how problematic is it if it is thoroughgoing? Does it infect us all and make us think too much and too prematurely that we're um, simply material beings with no uh, important and deeper aspirations. So that's one kind of question um, that I think it can raise. Another is just an intellectual question. Have the claims of religion, of revealed religion, been refuted or not? Um, we, I think, often speak and act as if they have been, especially at the modern university. You know, we have Freud, we have Nietzsche, we have Karl Marx, we have thousands of college professors who take it more or less for granted. We have the new atheists, at least we did in the first part of this millennium, very popular public intellectuals who take it for granted that reason is sufficiently powerful or science is sufficiently powerful to prove that um, divine revelation is not a possibility. I could be right, but is the question closed? And if it's not, then I'm in favor of thinking about it and opening it. And so thinking about Christian Rome can help us do that. 
And not only Christian Rome can help us do that, also Plato's Euthyphro is a dialogue where, you know, the wise Socrates takes the time to talk to a, a, a deeply devout, you might even say religious fanatic, to help see whether he really, he, Socrates, is, is able really to refute the religious alternative. So, and this is the this is the question essentially raised by the Giordano Bruno statue that we discussed earlier. I mean, Bruno implies, especially with the help of Giovanni Bovio's inaugural address, that we can live well by reason alone as a society. He's looking over at the papacy. The papacy answers, "No, we can't. <laughs> we can't live well by reason alone. We need." We need reason that is tempered or guided in some way by divine revelation and that points us upward and that gives us aspirations and gives us certainties that reason alone will not find. Reason alone will lead us confused and, and blind to all kinds of important truth. That's the claims of the babe. That's an interesting question, I think. I don't say that I'm eager for restoration of papal rule, I'm not. But I, I think studying papal room can help us keep that question alive. Um, I think studying papal room can also help with questions like, well, what virtues, what qualities do good citizens need? How, do, how are they related to Christian virtues? Is it a good thing to have an independent moral political authority that's transcendent and above the political sphere like the Pope claimed to be, like the UN claims to be? What problems does that pose? Is, is it always, does it bring some blessings? Um, so I think those are so, some of the questions that, that um, you know, I think that studying Christian Rome can help to raise. Um, generally speaking, it's a different kind of answer and a different kind of society than modern liberal society is. And that, I think, is good to see who disagrees with us and why. Um, and if we can refute them in, our, in a fair fight, <laughs> terrific. Um, if we can't, maybe we'll be better people for it. We, we often, in the university today, we often pay lip service, Wayne, to something called critical thinking. <laughs> and I think what you're saying is that studying Rome and taking seriously the the um, the Roman uh, uh, the different views that have been held in the course of Rome's history, the different world views, if you like, maybe that's the key to real critical thinking. I certainly think it can help to to try to to study what we used to say <laughs> the other um, and and not. And, and not just oneself. It's it's funny now, the, the other is, seems to me in contemporary discourse been forgotten. And it's, it's fine to judge the other very quickly. But yeah, I, I definitely think that, that it's hard to gain perspective on ourselves and that by studying societies that are different, um, that can help. And I think that not just that, but I, I do think that the societies represented in ancient Rome and Christian Rome were rich societies that were in many measures successful. I mean, obviously they had terrible problems too, got no hesitation in saying that, but um, I mean, productive of tremendous art, tremendous literature. I'm not just suggesting studying any old society that's different, but some, you know, serious rivals to Yeah, and um, maybe, that's what we want to do, not a political debate, but dialogues, uh, confronting our ideas uh, with our hosts and their opinions uh, with differences or points, common points, uh, and uh, yeah, through other th societies too. Yeah. So thank you so much. It was a pleasure to me, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, Anna. and David. It's been a lot of fun for me to have a conversation. I appreciate it tremendously. Thank so, you, Wayne, thank for you. thank you, Wayne, for joining us in our uh, the, the first of uh, of what we hope will be 
uh, many more uh, interviews, but thank you for um, thank you for starting us off in such a, an interesting way. Um, <laughs>